I'm over here. I'm Doc Steve. Whoa! That's better. And welcome to... Doc Steve's Amazing Science Seekers. So, who are these amazing science seekers? Well, they're the men and women of today who are devoting their lives to make the world a better place tomorrow. And a science seeker is really anyone who wants to know why stars twinkle, what makes a tree grow, how come we have ten fingers. Science seekers want to know the why, what, and how about everything. Now, I should warn you, at the end of this program, there will be a quickie quiz. So be prepared. Our first science seekers want to know how our brain works, how we learn to learn. And they're doing it by farming, slug farming. There's a sea slug here. There's a sea slug there. Here's a slug. There's a slug. Everywhere there's sea slugs. University of Miami has a sea slug farm. Tom Capo runs the farm. I've been a slug farmer for almost uh, 17 years. It's uh, quite a unique occupation. It sure is. After all, who else would want to raise slippery slugs? And it's hard work. Slugs eat a lot. That's why this slug farm grows seaweed. A lot of seaweed. These slugs eat, get this, 350 pounds of seaweed each week. And slugs also need to be washed and counted. Much of that work falls into research assistant Joan Clark's hands. Yuck. They feel like jello to me. And I, it's really not that big of a deal. It's like touching any animal. You have to get used to it. You have to know what you're touching and just be comfortable with it. Each slug is both male and female. And when handled, slugs can release a purple dye. I'm told if you work long enough with slugs, you grow fond of slugs. But you wouldn't call them cuddly. No, I wouldn't call them cuddly. They're a little too slimy to be cuddly. Now, a more technical name for this sea slug is a California sea hare. Hare is in rabbit because the front antennas look a little bit like rabbit ears. Now, this sea slug weighs about one pound. They can get up to 15 pounds. And no one would say this guy is cute. I think a better word might be, uh... Disgusting. Really disgusting. Yeah, that would be a better word. But these guys aren't being farmed for their good looks. They're being farmed for their brains. In fact, slugs' brains are so popular that slugs are sent to researchers all over the world. New York, Italy, Japan, and across town in Miami. We're looking for any kinds of changes, and that way we learn what the animal is learning and how. Researcher Dr. Tom Nolan is annoying this slug with a wooden stick. I'll give you the reason in a moment, but first... So why is a sea slug a better animal than, let's say, a mouse for learning how our brain works? Well, it all has to do with size and numbers. You see, inside our brain, there are about 10 billion neurons. Inside a mouse's brain, there are about 25 million neurons. But inside a sea slug's brain, there are only 8,000 neurons. Now, a sea slug and a mouse are about the same size. But that difference in neuron number, that's the difference between Joe Robbie Stadium full versus Joe Robbie Stadium almost empty. Now when the stadium's full and someone throws a piece of paper out onto the field, you can't tell who in the crowd threw it. But when the stadium is almost empty and you find a piece of paper on the field, you have a pretty good idea who threw it. The same is true for neurons in a brain. In a complex brain, it's very difficult to tell which neuron is causing which action. In a simpler brain, it's much easier to find out where the learning takes place. Got it? Thanks. Now, back to Dr. Nolan and his annoying wooden stick. The research here is called habituation. That is, learning to ignore the unimportant. Every 30 seconds, the slug siphon is touched by the stick and each time the slug retracts his siphon. This happens over and over and over and over and over again. Slowly the slug learns that being touched by a wooden stick is annoying, but it's not dangerous. It's learned that it doesn't mean anything. It's not of importance. And it would be best if the animal wasn't stopping its activity and pulling in its, uh, its uh, sensitive organs and uh, should go on about its regular business, which is usually feeding. And since the slug's brain is so simple, Dr. Nolan can then find the actual cells that learned about the wooden stick. 
This is uh, part of the nervous system that controls what we saw happening in the lab. We saw the siphon contracting whenever I touched it. Uh, the neurons that cause that to happen, the cells that do that are found right here. So when the siphon contracted, it was that part of the nervous system right. that made that decision. Right. And this is that, the actual place where learning occurs for this particular behavior. So slugs may not be the smartest creatures in the world, but they are smart enough to teach us a little bit about how our brain works. And that's why University of Miami has a sea slug farm. I heard a couple of oohs and yucks during that segment. I saw a lot of people uh, making some disgusted faces. Here joining us right now are Tom Capo and Dr. Tom Na Nolan, uh, slug researcher and slug farmer. And I know right off the bat, you folks have brought in some slugs. So if you could, who wants to hold a sea slug? Uh -oh. Whoa, everybody wants to touch a sea slug. <laughs> I didn't know slugs were this popular. Okay, here we go. Here's a big one. Hold on, let me put my mic down. Oh gosh. Okay, Dorothy, here you go, the pressure's on. There's a slug for you. Yuck. We got a little one right over here. Who wants to hold that? Here, how about Daniel, why don't you take a, a hold of that one? How does that feel? Good. Yuck, let me take a paper towel. How does, that, how does that feel? Good. Good? You like the feel of the slug, huh? Let me, let me pass along to somebody else. Here, Maureen. Oh, he got purple. He got he got dyed. Yeah. Well, luckily that comes right off. No, oh, you too. What's it feel like? Cold, hot? Cold. Cold. Yeah. Oh, we got this one's kind of dripping all over here. Here, George, you got this one. Oh boy, you're gonna be inked. Everybody's getting inked. Oh, can we take this big slug from you? Wow. Oh boy. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. You got it? It's big. Okay, anybody have any questions for our slug farmer and slug researcher? Yeah, Jonathan, what's your question? What are the epicide seaweed? What do they eat besides seaweed? Well, seaweed is their main diet, and in actuality, that's the important portion of their diet because that's where the ink comes from. This red pigment that you're seeing, the ink actually comes from the red seaweed, which I brought some, and that's how they get it. They eat the, the red seaweed, and they take the red portion of it and put it in special glands. Yeah, George? Are they a one-celled animal? No, they have 8,000 neurons and many more other uh, cells. So, uh, no, they have a lot of neurons. If you had to try to explain what every single one was doing, it'd be impossible. But it's a lot easier to explain what a few of them are doing uh, to explain how the animal behaves. And actually, Eric has a question um, right here. Yeah. How, how, how can um, humans learn more about their brain from the slugs? How can we learn more about our brains from the slugs? Now, there are a lot of things that we learn that we know that the slug can't learn. The slug can't learn to read. It doesn't have a language. But uh, some of the aspects of how we learn to do those things are probably going to be found in something simple, a simple nervous system like the sea slugs. OK, I want to thank Tom Capo and Dr. Tom Nolan. I think we've learned a lot about slugs. And can you help me with that right there? What does it say there? When we come back cleaning polluted water with a water zapper. Perfect. And we still have that quickie quiz. So stay with us. How many baby slugs do you think one slug can have under ideal conditions? I'll have the answer in a moment. So how many baby slugs can one slug have under ideal conditions? One slug can have up to 100 million baby slugs in a lifetime. Wow. Hi, welcome back to... Doc Steve's Amazing Science Seekers. Yes. Now we all breathe air, we all eat food, and we all drink water. Our next science seekers are working to make sure we can continue to drink water. And they're doing it with something called a water zapper. This is the water zapper. And you see that blue light shining on the water? Well, that light is an experimental high-powered beam which is electronically zapping out dangerous chemicals in the water. So how do those dangerous chemicals get into the water? Well, they could have gotten there from a place like this. It's not a pretty sight, it's a landfill. A mountain of rotting garbage which can release harmful chemicals into the dirt under the landfill, which can then poison the water under the dirt. So what's a water drinker to do? 
It's the water zapper to the rescue. It's designed to destroy the dangerous chemicals. Just like that. Now let me give you an overview of this place. Right over here, that's where water enters the facility. Then you pass through this 11,000 pound door into the transformer room. Now this huge transformer takes current and boosts it up to 1.5 million volts. It's amazing. Now inside here, there's an electron accelerator that takes electrons and shoots them through that tube right over there. And they pass through this wall. And this concrete hallway is here because when that machine's actually on, there's a lot of radiation. Now those electrons pass through this wall right over here, and they pass into this fan device. And right over there, that's where the water is at. Its ability to destroy all kinds of pollutants very simply, very quickly, makes it uh, a very desirable process. Now to help you understand what's going on, make believe this cue stick is the water zapper. And the cue ball is an electron, these three pool balls are one molecule of water, and the rest of the pool balls are a dangerous carbon compound floating in water. Now the electron accelerator in the water zapper shoots electrons into the water molecules, breaks up the water molecules, and those parts break up the dangerous carbon compound. Sort of like this. Hey, Doc Steve, that's pretty neat. Can I see that again? Sure, no problem. The electron accelerator shoots electrons into the water. The electrons break up the water molecules, which collide with the dangerous stuff in the water, and destroy it. Like this. It's kind of like... Uh watching an explosion occur because you're putting a tremendous amount of energy in here and the molecule just literally breaks apart. All of this reaction is occurring in the time it takes for the water to just fall through the light. Now the water zapper is still in the testing stage, but it does look promising. So who knows, this high-powered spark of inspiration could one day be the wave of the future. kind of sad that we need a water zapper, but joining us now is Dr. Bill Cooper, and who has a question about water zapping? Yes, Lauren. Um, how many volts of electricity do you use to zap the water? That's a very good question. We use 1.5 million volts. A lot of electricity. It's a lot of electricity. Do you know how much we use in our homes? About 110. That's so a it's a lot. lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Elizabeth? What happens to the chemicals after they're zapped out of the water? That's a very that's yeah. a very good question. <laughs> that's a question that we're working on, uh, but it appears that when these complex chemicals are zapped, they break down into carbon dioxide and water and just salts. So they become they're and they're all safe, so that's That's safe. right. Okay, who else? Daniel, yes. How how hot does the water get when after they're zapped? Yeah, does the water get really hot? Well, no, it doesn't, as a matter of fact, Daniel. It only, we only raise the temperature of the water about one degree or two degrees. So actually, if you had your hand before and after it's irradiated, you couldn't even tell that uh, the, the water even increased in temperature. Yes, George. Does the radiation give you cancer? That's, I'm sure a lot of people want to know that. All that's, this radiation. That's the question that everybody wants to know. Does this impart any sort of risk as far as cancer? And the answer is no. Uh, if you were inside that vault where we saw the blue picture, when it was on, you could actually get a very high dose of radiation, but there's no residual radiation in the water, and there's no way to get cancer from this. Well, that's good to know. Kathleen. Do you think in the future that instead of having to bring the water to the zapping machine, that they might make a machine that you can just take out in the water and zap it with? That's like kind of zapping it in your home. So. Well, it, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, it's amazing that, that you <laughs> asked that question because that's, that's one of the problems with, with toxic wastes. We can't bring all the toxic wastes to the water zapper, so we're making the water zapper mobile so you can take the water zapper to the problem and actually solve the problem right at the source. Some terrific questions. I want to thank Dr. Bill Cooper. And now will you guys help me uh, tell the viewers what's coming up next? When we come back... A science seeker searching for a killer. 
and we still have that quickie quiz. So stay right there. Can you guess how much water Americans use each day? I'll have the answer after this. So how much water do Americans use each day? We Americans use a staggering 450 billion gallons of water each and every day. Hey, welcome back to... Welcome back to... Okay, welcome back to Doc Steve's... Doc Steve's Amazing Science Seekers. <sighs> My next science seeker is looking for a killer. And not just any killer, this science seeker is looking for a reef killer. Dr. Lori Richardson is not out for a pleasure cruise. She's heading to a crime scene. And the killer is wanted all over the world. It's none other than the Black Band Disease. And that's why Dr. Richardson is not only a researcher, you could say she's a murder investigator. Scuba gear on, she goes to check out the victim. Working on this problem is kind of like solving a puzzle. The victim is 15 feet underwater. It's this reef, and you see that white part of the coral reef? It's gone. History, kaput. It's dead. Dead? You mean the reef is really dead? That's what I said, dead. Sort of a coral corpse. What you were just looking at was the skeleton of a reef. <sighs> that black band you see between the white dead part of the coral and the living coral is called black band disease. And as that band moves down the coral, more and more of the reef dies. The coral basically don't have any line of defense. They just get eaten alive, literally. Dr. Richardson's investigation begins by measuring how far the black band has moved. Nails mark where the band used to be. This one has moved about three inches in approximately two and a half weeks. And these corals sometimes take, grow only one centimeter in height a year, so three inches in two weeks is going to kill the coral. Photos are taken of the coral victim. A syringe is used to take a sample of the disease and a hidden thermometer keeps track of the change in the water temperature. Could temperature help the murderer? More evidence is needed. These bags collect water samples from deep under the coral. Dr. Richardson removes these bags and attaches new bags. The water collected may provide clues to see if nutrients in the water are helping the black band disease spread. <sighs> Tags like this one floating in the current, marking yet another coral skeleton, prove this underwater mystery is far from solved. If you look around, you see a lot of dead coral skeletons. The sea fans just look like twigs. A lot of the sea whips, again, look like sticks and twigs sticking up. And we don't know why this is occurring. Now, the next step is cleaning up the crime scene. And that's accomplished with something that looks like a vacuum and pretty much is a vacuum. It gets its suction from that air tank right over there. And then the black band disease and the dead coral get dumped into this cooler. The suction action just pulls up the black band filaments out of the coral tissue, takes all the disease off, and we discard it on land. After the vacuuming is over, Dr. Richardson then places modeling clay where the black band disease has been sucked away. The clay acts sort of like a band-aid. We press it into the line where we've just removed the black band and the dead coral tissue. What this does is it prevents other bacteria and potentially other black band or algae from getting into the freshly exposed coral tissue. The hours are long, the work is wet, but it's exactly what this science seeker wants to do. One of the great things about the work that I do that really means a lot to me is I feel like I'm really doing something good. This coral is literally hundreds of years old, and I'm saving this coral. You know, that's just the bottom line. It's a really, real, real strong sense of personal satisfaction, like I did a good deed. Some inspirational words there, and joining us now is that science seeker, Dr. Lori Richardson, and who has questions for Lori? 
Okay, Lauren, what's your question? Um, what do you when you when you suck up the the bacteria? What mm -hmm. do you do with it? After? We put it in coolers or sometimes big garbage cans and take it to land and either throw it on up on the ground so it can't get back into the sea or do experiments on it. We're trying to find out how it moves around in the water and gets on new corals. Yes, Lily. Will it ever affect the fish? It can affect the fish because the coral reef is the home for fish, especially larval fish and baby fish. So if their environment is destroyed and gets grown over by algae and other, other things, and that it destroys their habitat. So that could be an effect later on down the road. When you leave the clay there, what would happen if a fish tried to eat the clay? The fish do come along. It's non-toxic, and you can see <laughs> fish bites. So they're curious, but they don't take it away from that area. They leave it up there? They nibble, it, they nibble at it all the time. You can see fish bites all over the place, but it doesn't hurt them. We know that. When you remove it, does that stop the black band disease or just kind of slow it down when you're removing that, that black band? It stops it completely. Every once in a while, we go back and monitor, and you can see that some will go under the clay, but then we just remove it again. But it does work. You can save that coral's life. Okay, and one last question. Dorothy? Is there any way pollution causes the black band to, like, move around? That's one question that we're looking at. That's when, we're met, um, when you saw me taking the water bags out. We're trying to see if there is water coming up, polluted groundwater, but we don't know that again either. Some terrific questions. I want to thank Dr. Lori Richardson. And when we come back, a, a quickie quiz! quiz! So stay right there. Where is the only living coral reef in the continental United States? In a moment, the answer. So where is the only living coral reef in the continental United States? It's off the Florida Keys. It's one of the three largest reefs in the world. Welcome back. Now it's time for that... Quickie Quiz! First question. Here's a picture of a slug. Now, by just looking at that slug, can you tell if it's a male boy or female girl slug? It's not male or female. It's both male and female. That's right. Believe it or not, all slugs are both male and female. Now, next question. The water zapper uses how many volts of electricity to make electrons move fast enough to zap the water? One million volts of electricity. One and a half million volts. That's correct. Another right answer. Now finally, what's the name of the disease that's killing the coral reefs? Is it black plague disease, rubber band disease, or black band disease? Huh? Rubber band disease? Black band disease. Another correct answer. Well, that's all the time we have. Now remember, science seekers never stop looking for answers. Thanks for being a part of... Doc Steve's Amazing Science Seekers. So long! Bye-bye! So long! Bye -bye. So long.